All right. Would you turn in your Bibles to uh, the book of First John? The book of First John. We can talk about love, and that's fine. And sometimes we get to see love in action, which is just what that video was all about there. Uh, guys, hit that next slide too, would you? Austin, would you please hit, uh, go to there. I've got some scripture up there we'll want to follow along with, and the next one. But love um, is talked, obviously, a lot about in the Bible. God's love for us is his overriding purpose, chasing us down. Love is a feeling, and love is an experience, and in the name of love, it's weird to say, in the name of love, there have been wars that have been fought, right? In the name of love, cities have been built, in the name of love, songs have been, bit, been written, and in fact, Billboard magazine, which tracks all things in record sales and recordings, going back 70 plus odd, some odd years, I forget how far back they go, but Billboard magazine has tracked every song ever released to radio, and they used to track uh, jukeboxes too. And they have documented all of those songs, and they've categorized all of those songs. And it's probably no surprise to anybody that the number one category, the category with the most songs in it, are about love. Have love in the title or have something to do with love. There's more songs written about love than there is anything else, and that's kind of not a surprise. And so it's interesting that, that created in the image of God, God is love. And so somehow or other, he's built into us the ability to receive and give love, just like he has the ability to receive and give love because we are created in his image. And because we have the ability to give and receive love, we express love in a lot of different ways. So we write lots of songs about him too, you know, songs about love. The Apostle John is writing to believers then and now to help us understand the simplicity and the truth of the good news of the gospel, right? That's what he wrote. He wrote five books. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And he wrote the book of Revelation. And throughout his writings, he, f he has spoken a lot about love. And today, we're going to look at this chapter 3, just a few little verses, and I wrestled with this because I was going to take a bigger chunk of this. And then I got into it and I got, nah, I can't do that. I really want to focus on this. We're going to look at verses 11 through 18. 11 through 18. Let me read it to you. It says this. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 says, For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not marvel, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding within him. We'll talk about that in a minute. We know love by this, that he... Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, well, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or deed, but, uh, I'm sorry, let us not love with word or tongue, but with deed and truth. So throughout his writings, and particularly this letter, John is showing us that the Christian life is a relational experience. He's talking about the relationship we have with God and the relationship we have with each other. And that's what he's, he's expressing about that. And so there are two kinds of relationship going on here. There's a vertical relationship, and that's our relationship with the Lord. So there's a vertical relationship. We look up and go, God, are you up there? Because I'm... Sometimes we go, I I'm not sure I'm hearing him. I'm not sure I'm feeling him. But he's still there, right? So this vertical relationship with us and the Lord. And then there's a, there's a horizontal relationship. And that's the, our relationship with each other, right? Our relationship with how we interact with each other and treat each other. And so there's that. So our relationship with God 
is restored, our vertical relationship with God is restored when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That relationship makes us new on the inside. Well, what happens? When we're new on the inside, we start acting different on the outside. Right? That's what's supposed to happen. We're not supposed to get saved and then we stay the same old person. Right? We get saved because we become more like Jesus. And so this vertical relationship, there's a theological word for it. The relationship that we restore with the Lord, with God, there's a theological word, it's a $5 word, and the $5 word is justification. We are justified with God when we have Jesus, accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. So that restores us there. But then once we change on the inside, then we start changing on the outside. It makes us want to give. It makes us we be willing to say, you know, I want to share with somebody. That's what happens on the inside, and then it starts to output itself. And that's the horizontal relationship. So the horizontal relationship is the change that should happen or is happening if we are growing in the Lord and becoming like this. Horizontal relationship as a Christian happens in different ways. So for example, our willingness to give changes, you know, might be stingy. But after Jesus got a hold of me, I'm willing to share, right? It might be our attitudes change. Maybe our empathy changes. Maybe our compassion changes. How we interact with our fellow man. And the $5 word for this horizontal relationship, the $5 theological word for that is called sanctification. And there's two things that happen with sanctification. We've talked about this before, but it's important to know. It's important to know how this works, right? It's important to know. And so it's important to know that sanctification... At our point of salvation, we stand holy before the Lord because His blood has covered us and our sins are forgiven. But then there's something else that happens with sanctification. He meets us where we're at. The Lord isn't afraid of our dirtiness, you know? He isn't afraid that we, we are maybe a person of uh, quick, to, quick anger, okay? He, you know, and we use the example a lot, um, or I do anyway, you know, that, that uh, an addict or an alcoholic who comes to the Lord, God isn't going to save you to he keep you that way. Sanctification is what changes us so that we have the power through Jesus Christ to overcome those things that own us in the flesh. That's why it's important. That's why it's important to know this. Okay? So with that... Justification happens in that two-step process. Our immediate holiness with the Lord before Him, which gives us legal rights to, with the Father. It's important to know our rights, correct? Right? And then it, it meets us, Jesus meets us wherever we are, however messed up we are, and He starts to change us. And some of us are a little more messed up than we realize, because some of us have attitudes that are bad, right? Some of us are a little hot-headed from time to time. Some of us, right? <laughs> right? You know, we look at somebody and go, oh, they're really messed up. You know, there's three fingers pointing back here going, well, so are you, buddy. You know, and so sometimes we forget that we've got to make progress with the Lord, too. Okay, it's not just about coming to church. That is why it's an everyday thing. This is why it's a seven day a week kind of thing, because he's interested in our seven days a week, not just the hour and a half or two hours we spend on Sunday morning. And so. You know, there are times, in all honesty, there are times we go, I don't think I'm making any progress. I don't think God's listening to me. I'm trying. You know, I'm pursuing. But there's times I'm not sure He's, he's listening to me. And so it's in, this is important to know because God really does care about us. You know, even when it seems like He's not there, He really <clears throat> does care about us. And He really is interested in what's going on. And he really wants to be a part of our life. And he really wants what's good for us. So John writes this. There's a point to all this. John writes this in, in 1 John to help us know if we're making progress. You go, well, how, how's this going to be? How, do we, how do, am I going to know that I'm making progress? And I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the chase here. How we know we're making progress horizontally how we know we're making progress in our sanctifying experience, the, the change of becoming like Jesus. How we know we're making progress is, can be judged by how do we love, you know? It's not about, not that, not that knowledge isn't important. It's important to know what's in the Bible. 
it's important to read the Bible every day. We have access to the Bible, and we should read it every day. So it's important to know what's in there. But knowledge alone doesn't change us, right? You don't have to look any farther than a parent with a child who does something they have been told not to do. All right, let's put it this way. We've either had teenagers or we've been a teenager. And we have all had experienced this discussion. You should know better than that, right? It wasn't that knowledge isn't there. Knowledge was there. But the knowledge that was there wasn't enough to overcome the passion to go, I'm going to do it anyway, right? We've all been there. We either had that discussion with children or we've been the child that we had the discussion with or both, <laughs> Right? We might have been both. And so in that, John is saying here, there's a test. There's a test here to see how you're doing. And, and it helps us identify, uh, maybe I, I need to pray differently. Maybe I need to be more giving. You know, maybe I just didn't feel like I wanted to do this. But all of a sudden, I'll, you know, something inside my heart goes, no, I need to share. Right? And that's how love starts to output itself. So... We call John the apostle of love because he wrote so much about love in, in all of his writings. But he was also known, he and his brother James were known as the sons of thunder. Think about that for a minute. I think that's a cool nickname. Jesus called those guys the sons of thunder. You have got to know. When thunder roars, l rolls, you know it's coming, right? And you could probably hear those guys coming down the road. Either talking loud or fighting amongst themselves or whatever it was that they were doing. Whatever it was about their personality, Jesus called them the sons of thunder. But yet, John writes a lot about love. So see, we don't have to, we don't have to be wimpy in our love. We can be passionate about life and still be loving. And so, verse 14 identifies this test. John identifies this test. Look at verse 14. And while you're looking at that, John is talking about three things here. He's talking about love and hate. He's talking about life and death. And he's talking about the difference between talking about it or acting on it. Okay? So there's three things going on in these few little verses right here. Verse 14 says this. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. The true test of progress in our Christian life is not knowledge. It's not Sunday morning attendance or Sunday school attendance. It's not serving on the board. The true test of proof that we are living the new life in Christ, that we are changing horizontally in our relationship with each other, is that we love each other. If we don't love, John says this, we're abiding in death. Okay, this is, the, this is the, the loving disciple. He said, if you don't love, you're abiding in death. Okay, so we just need to take a look at what he's saying. So there's a test here. It's interesting that, that he uses Cain and Abel as our example. Because Cain and Abel were what? Brothers. From the same father and mother. And so we, we see them and... He points out that, that Cain, who was the evil one, slew his brother. So why does he use this example about Cain and Abel in the midst of talking about love? Well, he's saying this because he's, equip he's equating hate, which is not love, okay? Hate is the opposite of love. He's saying that the opposite of love is hate, <coughs> and if you have hate in your heart... For another person, you are committing murder. You know, well, how? I don't get well, how this connects. How does that connect? Well, the word hate kills relationships, right? Hate, if we hate another person, there's no relationship there at all. Are you with me? If we hate someone else, there's no chance of having a relationship. And you don't have to look any farther than politicians who have trouble loving each other to figure this out. You know, I'll use that as the example. You know, and there's no chance at some point that if there's hate going on in the room, there's not a whole lot of hope that, that they're, they're, they're going to 
hug each other and go on, you know. Remember when you got in trouble as a kid? All right, you two boys, you hug each other. Oh, I want to hug him. <laughs> but the purpose of that was to show that relationship had been restored, right? And so John is saying here, hate is the equivalent of murder. Murder brings death into a relationship. And what's going on here is that there can't be progress, there can't be relationship, there can't even be restoration until that hate goes away. <coughs> so Cain, because of hate, murdered a family member, literally his own brother. But because of hate, John is saying, it's the, you know, if you hate your brother, that's the same thing as murder. And so... As we look at this, he's using Jesus as our example of love. What is the reflection of Jesus' love supposed to look like in us? Okay. Well, he says here, jump down to um, verse 15 and 16. And, and we'll just read 16, 15 through 18 again. It says this, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. By love, Jesus sacrificed himself for us. And John's saying, that's our example. The image of Christ, if we're to look like our picture, we need to be giving in that way, to be loving in that way, to, to, to be willing to lay down our life in that sense uh, for another person, which is why we honor our veterans. I didn't plan it this way. I didn't plan this message today for Veterans Day. It just is, you know. Uh, but, you know, that's why we honor them, because they gave of their time. They gave of their service. They gave of their youth for the protection of good for, for everyone else, you know. And so in that sense, that is the, the ultimate commitment to let, put your life on the line for somebody else. So um, he says here in verse... Uh, 18, little ch children, let us, let us not love in word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. So let's focus on this deed and truth thing. What are we talking about? We're talking about the change that Jesus makes with us in our vertical relationship with the Lord, which changes our horizontal experience with each other. And our horizontal experience with each other changes because we're becoming more like the image of Jesus Christ. And because we're becoming more like the image of Jesus Christ, we're more loving to each other. We're more caring to each other. More, we have more concern for one another. And so he's saying, John's saying, we're to love in deed and truth. So what is a deed? Well, a deed is an action, right? A deed is an action that says, <coughs> I want to give a box to somebody because I want them to be blessed. I didn't plan this for this day either, so this is just kind of work. This is how God works these things out. But, you know, it changes. What changes is on the inside affects us as we reach out to each other horizontally. And so a deed is an action and what is truth? Well, re truth is a standard of reality. So basically, what's he saying here? He's saying love is not just talk. Love is action. It's just like everything else in the kingdom of God. Faith is an action. Prayer is an action. Worship is an action. And love is an action. All of those things are verbs. When you look at the context of how they're written to us, they're saying, don't just come and sit. That's not worship. Worship is every day exclaiming to God, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for helping me, being here, saving me, whatever it is. He accepts our praise, right? That happens all the time. So the test, let's talk about this test. He says in verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our life for, lives for the brethren. So the test is, the test of whether or not we're all in, the test of whether or not we're all in, John gives us a test. How are you loving? How are you loving? How are you loving? Have your attitudes changed? Are you withholding attitudes, right? Are you making progress in this Christian life this way? You know, it's kind of like this. Love, look at it this way. Love in our Christian walk is kind of like proof of performance, right? Would you buy a car that had not been proof of performance? 
Would you buy a car that's never been tested? Brand new car. Does it run? Well, we don't know. It's brand new. It looks good on the outside. Will it last a long time? Well, we don't know. We haven't tested the engine. Yeah. But it's shiny. You like shiny? I love shiny. My weakness, shiny cars. I love it when they're shiny. Does it run? Oh, I don't know. Because it's never, the proof of performance has not been given to this automobile. You want to buy it anyway? Well, I don't know. I like shiny. We're not going to buy something that has no proof of performance. And love for the Christian, the output of love from our vertical relationship, the output of love horizontally is a proof of performance. Is it making any difference at all? Have all the sermons <coughs> and all the Sunday school lessons and all the devotions and all the Christian music we've listened to made any difference at all? Because the proof of performance is something's changing as from our output, right? Dr. J. Vernon McGee, I've really grown to, to uh, appreciate his commentary. He writes extensively on, on the book of 1 John. And, and uh, he writes, I'm going to quote him here, okay? So I'll tell you when I stop quoting him, because this is a long passage that he wrote. <clears throat> but he writes this. He said, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. He's quoting John 3, 1 John 3.15. And he says this, Whoso, and he's quoting again, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. I didn't say that. John said that. And again, he's quoting the Lord Jesus in Matthew 5, 21 20, and 22. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whoever is angry with his brother shall, without a cause shall be in the danger of judgment. And whoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. May I say to you, these are strong words. The Lord Jesus said that if you are... If you have hatred in your heart towards your brother, it means you are a murderer. Envy and jealousy lead to hatred, and hatred is murder. How many murderers are there around today? Well, by this standard God has put before us, there are more murderers out of jail than there are in jail. Kind of fascinating thought. He said, I'm sure you realize this passage does not teach that an actual murderer cannot be saved because Christ paid the penalty for all sins, even taking the life of another. However, when a man is saved, he will no longer live in hatred. May I remind you that John's emphasis in this section is the two natures of the believer. Justification, sanctification. When you become a child of God, you do not get rid of your old nature. Rather, you have two natures, the old nature and the new nature. We have seen that the new nature is the only nature that can please God. Man in his natural state is unable to please God. The carnal mind is at odds against God. And he has this quote. He says, therefore, as believers, there are times when we feel like praying and there's times when we don't feel like praying because we're fighting our, our nature. And he says this, there's a hymn, Come Thou Fount, by Robert Robinson. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And there's a, a line in that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And then Dr. McGee says, someone read that and said they didn't like that line. So they wrote a new line to it. And he said, so in some of the songbooks you find the original line, and some of the songbooks you find the new line. And the new line says, prone to worship, Lord, I feel it, prone to serve the God I love. And he says this, which is true of the believer? Prone to wander, or is he prone to worship? He says, I tell you that both of them are true. I have a nature that's, that I've discovered is prone to wander, and I have another nature that's prone to worship. God says, if you're my child, then when you will show my nature, you will, you will show that new nature which I've given you if you're my child. And so... I think that's a great explanation of what's going on there. Because we do have these two natures. We fight against it. We do the things we don't want to do. Sometimes I wish I hadn't have said that. <coughs> Sometimes we go, I wish I hadn't have thought that. You know? And so John is equating this, but we don't have to look very far to see the unregenerated nature, right, shows itself in things like racism. It shows itself in things like Classism, racism is hate. Classism is, is hate. And for whatever thing that politics is supposed to be good at, it seems to bring out the worst in everybody. You know? 
So, so there's, there's hate going on there. But John is saying hate kills relationships. And so it's the same as murder. So when it comes to loving others, we have to recognize that Jesus, like Jesus, uh, we don't have, no, I'm sorry. When it comes to loving others, we have to recognize that loving like Jesus is not our first nature. Loving like Jesus isn't what we're, it's not built inside of us. What do we build to, to love first? Anybody guess? Ourselves, that's right. That's right. You don't have to teach self-love and you don't have to teach self-will to a toddler. They figure that one out all by themselves. And if you ever wanted to understand what God did by bringing Jesus to us to change us, watch a child. Because they learn to give a tantrum. You don't have to teach a child to have a tantrum. They do that on their own. But Jesus is saying, you know what? That's, that's, that's not what I want you to be. I don't want you to be like that. I, I, I want you to become like me. So that sin nature makes us selfish. And the sin nature makes us love ourselves first before we love others. But he said, then his command, he said, I, I command that you love one another. The test of being all in is this. How do I love my brothers and sisters? How am I loving vertically? That's the test. That's the proof of my performance. How am I loving? Am I loving? Do I still have some things in there? Well, we all have things in there. Let me, just, let me cut to the chase. We all have stuff we're going to, what we're fighting. And it doesn't matter how old you get. You all, we all have stuff that we're chasing down that doesn't look like Jesus Christ. And he's going, I, I want to fix that. I want you to be like me because you're going to like life a whole lot better if we can, if we can get that out. You know, so he keeps polishing and he keeps rubbing on us and keeps shining us. So the proof of the test is our actions. Look here again, verse 17. It says, whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him. Well, how does the love of God abide in him? How does the love of God abide in that? If we're unwilling to share, right? Little children... And he's not railing on these people. Look how he addresses them. He's little children. He, he's not going, even though he's one of the sons of thunder. He is loving in how he approaches this. He said, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Let's just not talk about it. We can talk about it. It's easy to talk about stuff when you're sitting in a room. You know, it's easy to sit in a room and make plans. The toughest part of making plans is leaving the room and going to go to them. We spent... About 24 hours with, with uh, other brothers and sisters from our Churches of God uh, in Danville over the last couple of days, uh, uh, Brett and Chastity and Zach and Lauren and Bobby and I, for um, a missional church initiative. And we set and made some plans. But the hard part is, okay, now we got, we got to do what we said we we're going to do. That's tough. It's tough. So it's easy to say, I want to love. It's hard to go... I don't really like them. <laughs> right? I'm not, it's not, I can't say that we're, we're closest of friends. And the Bible says, uh, uh, Steve, 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 I need you to love them. Right? So the output of love, the output of love, here's the test. The output of love puts the needs of others first. It's putting ourselves second, and the output of love puts the needs of others first. Well, what needs do other people have? Well, they have physical needs, right? They have physical needs, but people have emotional needs as well, right? We know people, you don't have to think hard. You know people who are fighting disappointment, despair, depression. You don't have to think hard, to know that there's people who need to be encouraged. They just need to know somebody cares. They just need to know it, that their life matters to somebody else. And love reaches out beyond us and says, you know what, I don't need to watch that TV show. I'll call them. Let me just call them. I can watch a TV show another time. If you've got a DVR, you can watch it whenever you want, right? So... Physical needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs, the deeds of love, the action of love is built into all those things. Because sometimes the first thing that people need they don't know is the salvation of Jesus Christ to change them. 
And the only way they'll hear that, and you know, sometimes I think we get, we get a little scared. You go, I don't know how to share the Lord. I don't know how to share salvation to someone. It's as simple as this. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. Share your example. Share your love. Share your, your experience. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. He saved me. And that alone meets that need because the first thing that anybody needs is salvation because you can't, can't ultimately change someone's heart until you help them give their heart to Jesus Christ. And so from there, spiritual, need, or, uh, yeah, spiritual needs, emotional needs, physical needs, are we willing to try to help and give of ourselves? Because just like our Savior, He's asking us to, what's it say? Verse 15, 16. We know this, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down the TV for the lives of others. We ought to lay down the remote for others and give some of our time for others. So in that, it's as simple as that, but I get it. I truly get it that sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's scary. And God knows that too. Sometimes it's scary to say, I want to help somebody. I'm going to get outside myself. But man, I don't know what to say to them. And, and just know that the Lord says, don't think about what you Don't worry about what you're going to say. I'll tell you what you say when it comes time. You just be willing to go. Just be willing to go. Just share what Jesus did with you. That's all he's asking. That's how we output love to another. So I want to encourage you today that we as a fellowship, you know, I get it. It's kind of scary. But Together, you ever had to do something? Well, put it this way. You ever had to do something on your own? And it's hard. It's hard when you have to go by yourself. But what do you get? Hey, man, you want to go with me? Yeah, I'll go with you. What do you need? Well, I need to go do this. And all of a sudden, there's courage together. You know? There's courage when we work together. And so as a fellowship, just know that there's courage when we work together. When we say, you know what? I'm going to make a commitment to share what God has done for me, what Jesus has done for me, how he's changed me. I'm going to make a commitment. And if you'll do that, you don't even have to go find somebody. You don't have to go knock on somebody's door. God's going to bring you somebody. He's going to say, Steve, that's your assignment today. I want you to share with them, physically, spiritually, or emotionally. Maybe they just need, maybe they just need somebody to listen and, and to tell them, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. Can I pray for you right now? Sure. So that's how love outputs, because love is an action. Love is more than just words. The purpose of the kingdom of God is to bring the goodness of God into the lives of other people while we're here on earth. That's our assignment. That's our mission during our time in history. Love activates the kingdom purpose into the lives of others. That's what he's talking about, deeds. When you see that word deeds, <clears throat> that's what he's saying. Do something, do the, give the blessing of the kingdom into somebody else. You know, we ask God to bless us. And it's okay to ask God to bless us. It's okay to say, God, I am in need of this. And, and, and I just want to say this. We're not cul-de-sac Christians. Blessing is not a one-way thing. Blessing is not a return on investment. Because you can't give enough money to get God to bless you. If you're giving money to get God to bless you, then you're giving it for the wrong reason. If someone has told you that giving money to the church is an investment, it's not. Giving money to the Lord says, I'm going to trust you. Lord, with 90%, I'm going to give you 10, and I'm going to trust you to help me make that 90% go all the way that I need it to go. So it's not about that. It's about his kingdom shining light into darkness. Love starts with us saying, I, I, I'm willing to trust God with 90%, okay? That's not about, I'm not, I don't talk about money, and you know I don't talk about money. I'm just saying, what is God saying to us? Well, it's not about giving to get an investment back. Okay, it's not a return on investment. It's about giving out of love so that the kingdom can flow into the lives of others. I want to be blessed, he's saying. Can you want to be blessed? Then I, want you, I don't want you to be a cul-de-sac Christian. 
you need to live on a thoroughfare so that that blessing can be passed on to somebody else. Because if you keep all my blessings for you, you're not doing anything good for me for the kingdom. That's what he's saying. And so the, the rewards for giving through love and the lives of others really affects our time in history now, the temporal, but it affects somebody else's eternity. And you don't have to look any farther than that video, and we, I also didn't know that was coming, but that's a perfect example of the impact that the kingdom of God did on that young man's life just by giving out a physical need. So, you know, we as, as leaders here have got together and we started praying for vision for us as a fellowship. God, show us what you want us to do. Show us what our purpose is. Show us how you want us to move forward. Show us what you need us to do. And we're willing, Lord, we're willing to do that. So we're looking for that. And we pray together. And I say that to say that, that it's, a, it's kind of scary to go, I don't know what God's going to ask me to do. <laughs> but collectively, there's, there's courage together, right? That's what, we, that's what we hit when we come together. Austin, hit this next slide for me, would you please? It's in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. There's a little bit of it there. I'm going to read it. It says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promises is faithful. Who's he talking about? He's talking about God. He who promises is faithful. When we don't think he's paying attention, he who promises is faithful. He is paying attention. Right? Verse 24, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more you say that, see the day drawing near. What's he saying? He say, hang together. Hang together. Work together. There's courage together. We can do this together. And we can do this as an outpouring of our love individually and then collectively. Hit the next slide, Austin. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 15 says, We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. You know, the deeds of love watches out for the betterment of another person. That's how you go, I don't know how I can not like somebody and love them. That's exactly how you can not like somebody and love them. Is by watching out for the, that which is good for another and for all people. I'm not saying we shouldn't try to like others. Don't give me, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying we shouldn't try to like one another. But if there's times you just go, I don't like that person, but I can still love them because I can seek out the benefit for them. I can seek out their betterment. So that's what he's saying there. And then Jesus said this, last slide, Austin. Matthew 22. Matthew 22. If you want to call a linchpin, here's a linchpin to all things. So the proof of performance is love. If the proof of performance is love, Jesus summarized what that looks like. He says this in Matthew 22, verse 35. It says this, one of them, a lawyer, which was a religious leader of the day, right? And he was trying to get Jesus into a, a corner. He's trying to talk Jesus. He's trying to talk the Almighty who spoke the world into existence. This lawyer is trying to talk God into a corner. <laughs> okay? Just understand what's going on there. One of them, a lawyer, says... Ask a question, testing him, says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Right? None of this works without love. Christianity doesn't work without love. And Jesus is our example of that. As the, as the example to lay down his life out of love for us, <coughs> he's saying, you can't do this with your head only. Now, you can do some good things with your head only, but you can't, you can't make this thing work with just your head if your heart's not in it. You ever had anybody who said, hey man, your heart's not in it? I, I'm just guessing, but I imagine Brett's had some football players who's had to say, dude, your heart's not in this. Do you want this or not? Am I right? And Jesus is saying to us, 
your heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, which is everything that you have, right? It's your mind, your will, and your emotions. And he says, and with all, and with all your mind. So, not head knowledge, but heart action. Because the heart, with the vertical restoration of relationship with Almighty God, changes our heart, which then changes how we react and act with each other. And He's great enough to do it. We just need to be willing to share when God taps us on the shoulder and says, Hey, Steve, I need you to reach out to that person. They have a physical need. They need something for Christmas. Are you willing to at least do that? They just need somebody. They need an ear. Will you be willing to listen to them, Steve? Just go over and... Can you give up, Steve? Can you give up a TV show? Go talk to someone? And sometimes it's spiritual. Can you share what God did for you? How, how you got from what you were to what you are now? And that's all he's asking. I'm not going to ask any, any big thing today. I, don't, I just hope this is encouraging to you. I don't even want any music. I just hope this is encouraging. I hope it's encouraging to know that, that God is still working on us. He's, he's not going to give up on us. He's working to change our inside so that our outside changes. And there are times you go, I've messed up so bad, Lord. And he goes, I know, but I still love you. You just have to trust me and, and help, let me help you move beyond this point because I want you to look like Jesus. I want you to look like Jesus. So I hope this is encouraging because he will do that for us, not only that we can be changed, but that we can help someone else because that's what he's asking us to do. In Verse 18, little children, let us not love in word and tongue, but in deed and truth. In deed and truth. Would you stand? Anybody want to share anything this morning? We've got a minute or two. There's always space to praise the Lord. We'll make space to praise.